the very geometry of creation is what we call love. It's groovy. It's being in the sweet spot. And everything else is just noise in the signal. Everything else is just static. And we can use pure tone to bring ourselves into that sweet spot. Well, I, I'll tell you why I think it is. And that's because the military in the last decade has come out with sound cannons. They've come out with riot shields that emit a frequency that suffocate people. I think the military just co-opted all of the research on sound and made it secret. And I said, hey, yo, welcome to O-Culture. I am Ryan Peverly. What's happening? I'm glad you guys are here because in this episode, I'll be chatting it up with Eileen Day McCusick, author of Tuning the Human Biofield, Healing with Vibrational Sound Therapy. But first, a quick thank you to my man VHS Dreams. You're listening to his song Frequencies. There's a link in the show notes to the song on SoundCloud. If you're interested, and you should be, he's a good dude. This is a good track. Throw him a few bucks on Bandcamp. And again, a perfect track, at least title-wise, to set the mood for my conversation with Eileen. Because Eileen is way smart when it comes to frequencies. She's a researcher, writer, educator, and practitioner who has been studying the effects of audible sound on the human body since 1996. She is the originator of biofield tuning, a unique therapeutic method that utilizes tuning forks. She's also the founder of the Biofield Tuning Institute in Burlington, Vermont. Her extensive research and practice in the field of therapeutic sound spans both the academic and alternative realms. Eileen has a master's degree in integrative education and has taken a break from her PhD studies on integral health and biofield science in order to work on her second book. She is trained and worked as a massage therapist, yoga instructor, sound healer, and wellness educator, and has also had a successful parallel career in business. Eileen combines her background in both wellness and business to form a practical, grounded, logic-based approach to understanding and explaining how and why sound works therapeutically. She maintains offices in Burlington, Vermont, and San Diego, where she conducts sessions and trains students in biofield tuning. She also travels to teach and speak at conferences about consciousness, cosmology, and the biofield. It's an honor and a privilege for me to have Eileen here. Eileen, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, I love talking about this stuff, so thanks for having me. No problem. So let's go back to the beginning then. How did you come to venture down the path of not only being interested in sound therapy, but making a career out of it? I got into all of this because I was trying to heal myself. I ended up, I think like most American teenagers, just really messed up. You know, by the time I got out of school, I was deeply broken And uh, started reading self-help books to try to repair myself. And just that, just, you know, I think for anybody who's a researcher, you know, that kind of path is like one rabbit hole after another after another, right? And you you read one book and then that opens a door to another book or another topic and uh, you just keep rolling with it. And so I think that... I ended up, that journey led me to a book on the use of color, sound, and music in healing, like vibrational healing, uh, which, you know, I think I read on the heels of, I don't know, quantum healing by Deepak Chopra, when I was basically introduced to quantum physics, like just the whole idea that everything is vibration. And I remember thinking, well, treating vibration with vibration is just, it's very logical, right? If I'm just a packet of vibrational information, then you know you're you're it's the most direct route to modulating my vibration is with vibration 
And the way that my mind works, I'm just very logical. I'm just always looking for what makes sense. And I used to drive my mother crazy. You know, she'd be like, you can't tell that child anything. She's got to figure it out for herself. So mm-hmm. I've discovered that truth really does have a ring to it. And, you know, when something it doesn't ring true, then I've always just wanted to dig deeper and figure out what does ring true. So I just started, um, you know, I've started trying to find everything I could back in, this was like 95 probably, on the use of color and sound and music. And then I got a catalog that had a set of tuning forks for healing in it. And I just ordered them impulsively. And at the time I had a part-time massage therapy practice. So I just started playing with the forks with, you know, some people that I felt were willing to be guinea pigs. And, um, just started making really interesting discoveries with them right off the bat and then just never stopped. You know, it's been 20 years now. Yeah. And you mentioned the phrase, the ring of truth. And there's other phrases out there like good vibes, bad vibes. And we toss these phrases around with people, you know, in person or on social media. But a lot of people, I don't think, realize that these phrases have legitimate meaning to them, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm coming to see because I've done a bunch of interviews. I've been filmed for some documentaries. And what I'm realizing is that there's just no conversation about sound and how it affects us or music and how it affects us. Or even the fact that we're electromagnetic beings, you know, like everybody's so into like chemical and mechanical ways of thinking that they we just kind of overlook the fact that we are electrical and vibrational. But when you start talking about it with people, then they're like, oh, yeah, <laughs> like of course we are, right? <laughs> but it's not at the forefront of thinking. When I was doing research for my thesis, I was astonished at how little research there was in things like PubMed and Medline and, you know, medical journals on how we are affected by audible sound, both destructively and constructively. It was like, it's just this big void of research. Yeah, why is that, you think? Well, I'll tell you why I think it is. And that's because the military in the last decade has come out with sound cannons. They've come out with riot shields that emit a frequency that suffocate people. I think the military just co-opted all of the research on sound and made it secret. That, that's what I think. Well, that's a pretty well, simple explanation and plausible when we know how the deep state works, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's establish a couple definitions up front for listeners before we go any further because, you know, you do this in your book and it was very beneficial as you get further into how this all works together. So up front here, let's establish, first of all, what energy is. You break that down in the book and it's really quite simple. Could you explain that? Yeah, you know, I think when we talk about energy medicine, you know, there are certain phrases that when people hear, they really get a bee in their bonnet. You know, they, they get, uh, they send up these defenses. So one of, and, and this is all subconscious programming, and actually tuning forks is one of those words too, where people immediately get their woo-woo bells start going off, right? <laughs> right. And and so energy, when we talk about energy medicine, one of the difficulties that that people get stuck in there, they're like, well, what is the energy in energy medicine? You know, what are you talking about? The idea of like subtle energy, energy that hasn't been measured, you know, since we can't measure it, there's this whole sort of mainstream standard model line that there's no such thing as an energy field. Like you don't have an energy field, Reiki and anything that purports to work with energy is snake oil and pseudoscientific nonsense, right? That's the sort of standard party line around all of that. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time, I can't tell you how many books I read uh, and how much time I spent thinking about this, trying to understand it, uh, reading all kinds of books. And, you know, I think that the energy in energy medicine, it's, it's just electromagnetism. That's really all it is. And what we call subtle energy, to me, is just subtle electromagnetism. And I describe it metaphorically as, um, you know, as water vapor is to water, Subtle energy is to electricity. It's the same thing. It's just finer. It's more diffuse. And just like you can't measure water vapor with a measuring cup, right? You can't measure subtle energy with like a voltmeter. It's just, it's too fine. It's too diffuse. 
but it's the, it's basically our energy field is the same thing as our body. You know, it's got water in it. I mean, we're continually evaporating. So, so we give off this sort of cloud of moisture around us. And moisture, water carries electric charge, right? Water with minerals. So, you know, we've got heat around us. We've got acoustic emissions going off of us. Every single thing in your body is in motion. Everything that's in motion makes waves, right? So, so we've got this kind of acoustic atmosphere around us as well and that's subtle energy i mean you know sound is energy it's yeah, so that you, sorry I, I don't mean to cut you off but the subtle energy was a term i was unfamiliar with i hadn't actually heard that but the way you define it in the book in some different cultures you know words like chi and prana and ka mm-hmm. i think even ether and organ tie into this as well does this yeah. differ then from regular electromagnetic energy i'm still unclear like is it the same exact thing or is it just a byproduct of EM energy? I think it's both. You know, it's the same thing. A subtle energy is present wherever measurable classical electromagnetic energy is present. Um, it's just a more subtle, you know, expression of it. And just like water behaves in different ways at different thresholds, right? Water can be vapor, it can be a liquid, or it can be a solid. So electromagnetic energy is the same way. It's just got these different states of expression. And um, yeah, what we what we call chi or prana or anything like that is just the sort of more subtle or finer aspects of light. Everything is light, <laughs> really, right. is what it comes down to. So... How do you define consciousness then, and how does it apply here? Um, when I was trying to define consciousness, I, I asked a carload of teenagers what <laughs> what they thought. Yeah. I was like, hey, guys, you know, what's consciousness? And the youngest one in the car, who I think was like 10 or 11 at the time, he said, it's being aware of your wants or needs. Uh, the older one said, you know, oh, it's that part of you that tells you to do the right thing and you ignore it. <laughs> I was like, no, no, that's your conscience. Yeah, that's different. yeah consciousness. Uh, you know, self-awareness, I think, awareness of, of being. And, you know, this is an interesting topic because in our, again, coming back to the standard model, you know, the, the party line is that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of brain activity and it arises from matter and that when you die, you know, that's the end of you. That isn't logical. I mean, when did... When did the thought of something ever precede the actual being of something, right? I mean, matter precipitates from the finest to the most gross. So, you know, from a states of matter perspective, we would look at ether, um, which is the essential oneness of all. Modern science calls that the Higgs field, an invisible field that's present everywhere that matter arises from. So from a more classical standpoint, I use the terminology ether, which is the the luminiferous ocean of light, of potential, that then uh, spins itself into the polarity of positive and negative, the masculine and feminine charges, Shiva and Shakti. There's all different kinds of words to describe that. And then it's the dance between these polarities uh, that gives rise to plasma. Plasma then, you know, is un, it's a undifferentiated potential that then starts to hook up and become like hydrogen so that turns into gas and then liquid and then solid so you have to start with the fine in order to create the gross not the other way around and so you know consciousness to me the whole thing is conscious the whole luminiferous ocean of beingness is consciousness that then becomes you know more and more and more dense as it pairs up, as molecules connect, you know, as atoms connect. So consciousness is the ground state that matter arises from, which is a very different model. And actually, I take this even further, because what I'm saying in my research, what my research has revealed is that in our energy field, you know, which I see as a diffuse magnetic fluid or a bioplasma, that is like a bubble that surrounds our body. It's like our own little personal cloud where all our memories are stored. So in addition to like muscle memory or brain memory, we also have standing waves of energy and information that surround our body. And I've actually mapped this field. 
I've, you know, by bouncing sound off of people and listening to what comes back, I've discovered this sort of binary coded um, specific storage unit that surrounds the body. And I'm able to access specific memories in specific areas. For example, if you had a traumatic birth, I'm going to find an, an area of turbulence in your field about five feet off of your right knee. And so not only can I find that with a tuning fork, when I stick a fork in it, it's going to produce a chaotic tone that you're going to hear, that I'm going to hear, that you're going to go, oh, yeah, I had a traumatic birth. But the cool thing is, is that I can keep putting the tuning fork, which is a coherent input, into that incoherent region in your field, and your body will actually recalibrate itself, and it will retune that pattern that's there into a more coherent expression yeah <laughs> <laughs> so since you touched on the biofield there you know this is a term that again i was unfamiliar with i believe you coined it i'm not sure no, i didn't coin it no no it was actually coined by beverly rubick in the mid 90s when during her work with the national institute of health so this has actually been like a scientific an academic topic for over 20 years. It's just been, it's hard to get money for research for this sort of thing. You know, the pharmaceutical companies dominate academic medical research and everything is very focused in on this chemical mechanical level. So there hasn't been a ton of science done and it's still kind of edgy. You know, when you start going off into talking about consciousness, talking about anything outside of solid liquid and gas, it's just like verboten, you know, it's the danger zone. It's considered a battlefield, actually, which is really interesting, right. this frontier of research, because there's a, you know, the, the keepers of the standard model try really hard to stop people from going here. But I just want to finish that thought about consciousness and energy, because what I'm saying is, is that consciousness exists outside of the body. And if my consciousness, my memory, my subconscious mind and my conscious mind can be accessed outside of my body, then where do I actually stop? Where does my consciousness end, right? I mean, there's no real barrier. I mean, there is a barrier. I see what, what in plasma physics is a double layer plasma membrane that's like the outer skin or barrier that keeps our bubble and keeps these standing waves in it. It's like the ionosphere or the heliosphere, the same idea. But really, that's a permeable membrane. So, you know, if we can actually demonstrate that what we call consciousness exists outside of our body, then it raises a very interesting question about, well, where do, where do I end and where do you begin? Yeah. And you mentioned that this is a battlefield and I, I think it's a, a literal battlefield as well. I think we're being bombarded without realizing it by all these towers and technology. And I, I think it's intentional. You know, I think we're a, yeah. war, a war is being waged against us that we can't see, but it does affect us, obviously. Absolutely. I mean, you know, because everything in your body, even though we're taught that it's chemical signaling, it's actually vibrational signaling. It's all light and information transfer. And, you know, you're you actually have little antennas on every cell membrane that are constantly reading vibrational information that's going on within the body, but also coming from without I did some work with families who live near industrial wind turbines here in Vermont. The insanity of those things. They put them up on ridge lines in neighborhoods. And uh, they make continual sounds, both infrasonic, ultrasonic, and audible. And what I was finding was that these people were getting these sounds entrained into their own systems. That there was one family that I listened to that actually I could hear the Whoa, whoa, whoa. like coming from their bodies. Wow, and really? That, that is a huge signal interrupt. It makes the body unable to hear its own signaling. And it created all kinds of disruption in them. It's so tragic, you know, and that there's such denial that people actually get affected by these things. You know, cell towers, uh, high tension power lines, um, radio waves. I mean, we're constantly bombarded with all kinds of signals. Now, if you're healthy and strong and your adrenal kidney complex is strong, then you create, you're, you're like Star Trek, you know, when they put their shields up, you get into a battle and we're like, shields yeah. up. 
Yeah. So the, the outer membrane of your field actually maintains a kind of protective barrier around you that helps keep you, you know, kind of protected and adaptive to all of those things and able to still kind of hear your own signaling. But if you go into exhaustion or, you know, you get really sick, your adrenal kidney complex crashes, your shields go down, and then you're really vulnerable to this stuff. And once your shields are down in this environment, it's so hard to get them back up again. Have you seen any photos of people, and I've only seen one, so I don't, I don't know if there's any more out there, but I saw a photo a few weeks ago on social media of this guy that was walking on a sidewalk, and he had on like a contraption around his waist that had like a circle around his body like five or six feet around him, and he was like, you know, this is my personal space, I don't want you to walk into it. And when I read your book, I thought of this photo and I thought, that's my personal energetic space. Like you mentioned, the biofield extends several feet away from the body. Is the biofield then the same thing as what some people might call an aura? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, you know, there's so many different words, right, for the for this subtle energy uh, body. Yeah, it's been called an aura. It's been called a uh, human energy field. It's the same thing. It's the idea that, yeah, we have an atmosphere around us that is us. And, you know, everybody knows that. I mean, everybody's gotten a bad vibe off of somebody. Everybody's gotten a good vibe off somebody. Everybody's had the experience of meeting somebody at a party and just within a few minutes of talking to them, you just resonate with them, right? Your fields are intermingling. You're, you are feeling into them with what I call our wave sense, and the wave sense, I don't know, historically, it's been called our sixth sense, you know, which is this sort of dubious thing that some people might have, but it's certainly not to be trusted. Um, but what that really is, is the fact that we have these little antenna on all our cell membranes. They're called primary cilium. They have structures called microtubules that I believe are the antennas that read the information in our field and also um, broadcast. And it's to me that is the biological mechanism of what we call intuition or what we call our sixth sense. It is our our just our feeling sense, our our the the sense that catches those vibes. And it's not woo woo. It's just a standard sense that everyone has, you know. And it's it's been um, relegated to the to the realm of of dismissal. And I think it's really important that we understand that this is a, bi a biological mechanism of being human. And that that we feel other people's fields in that way. And we know right away if we like someone, we don't like someone, we jive with someone, we're attracted to someone, or, you know, and everybody has everybody knows that we just don't talk about it in any kind of down to earth kind of way. Well, I don't think people know how to articulate it. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's why I'm articulating it. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's why you wrote this book, right? <laughs> yes. Exactly. Um, hey, you have a great explanation, too, of what sound is in the book and specifically how sound works with the water in the body. Could you take us through that? Sure. Well, first of all, there's two definitions to sound. One is uh, sound that we hear, that we as humans identify as auditory input and that's in the range of about 20 hertz or cycles per second to about 20,000 hertz. Another definition of sound is that it's, you know, vibrations of any frequency. And since, you know, in the beginning was the word uh, nada brahma, which means all is sound. It's like basically everything is vibration. Every single thing that we see in the explicate vis visible universe, even the invisible is what we could call sound. So sound actually travels through the more solid something is, the more rapidly sound transfers through it. So it doesn't go through air very fast. If you've ever been in a place where it's foggy, you know, you can hear train whistles off in the distance because the molecules of water are actually transferring that sound. Uh, same with our body. So sound travels anywhere between four and five times faster through water than it does through air. So sound is actually a great input, you know, into the body because it really, uh, it travels through, it informs, you know, and it also destructively, you know, we're, we're constantly 
uh, reacting to the sounds around us, whether we realize it or not. And if they're beautiful sounds, then that helps us to relax and to feel good and to feel coherent. And if they're awful sounds like your rageaholic father screaming when you're a kid, you're going to go into contraction around that. And so what a lot of people have wrong with them is they have contraction and tension in their bodies from when they have received non-beneficial tonal inputs, you know, whether it's an explosion or war or somebody yelling or, you know, it's very often sound related that, that sound can freeze us and constrict us if it's, if it's grating or non-beneficial and it'll affect us very powerfully. And it can also have obviously the opposite effect. Oh, yeah. I mean, it can be weaponized, obviously, too. So, yeah. yeah and absolutely. if the body is what, like 70% water and sound travels four to five times faster through water, it makes sense that sound as a healer would be quicker, more beneficial to the body. It is, it's very efficient. Like, my this method of biofield tuning is extraordinarily efficient. It gets the job done quick because it just gets right into the essence of what's going on. Well, let's get into that. You actually developed a process called sound balancing. What is that exactly? Sure. So actually, you know, sound balancing is the term I use in the book. The About a year after I wrote the book, or maybe even less, one of my clients referred to it as biofield tuning. And I was like, oh, I like that name so much better. <laughs> Right. So, you no, know, and it's had different names over the years. Like when I first started doing it in 96, I called it harmonic balancing because I realized that what the tuning forks reveal, the fundamental tone doesn't change. But the way that the sound sounds to you, the way that the overtones or the harmonics are accented or suppressed was really what revealed what was going on. And I and that what was changing as I was working with people therapeutically was the harmonics the of of the sound and you know clearly of their bodies as well so I call it harmonic balancing then uh, I started working at a spa and they were like mm, let's change it into body tuning so we called it that for a while then I called it sound balancing from a web guy who I worked with and then <laughs> we switched it so it's had four names uh, but I'm stuck with biofield tuning now so let's just call it that so that this is a sound therapy method it's very uh, specific protocol we have very specific tools that we work with, and we have a map that we follow, what I call the biofield anatomy map. And it's a process of starting about five feet away from the body and uh, just using, I use extremely high quality tuning forks. I had to have them specially made for me because I was wearing out ordinary tuning forks. The first person in the history of therapeutic tuning forks to actually wear them out. And so my manufacturer, Medivibe, produced a really exceptionally high quality tool for me. Uh, so they're twice the price of ordinary forks, but they're really amazing. So we use these special forks. We start about five feet away and we uh, activate the fork and we slowly move in towards the body. We, we find the edge of the field and then we start to move in. And what we're doing is we're listening for and feeling for areas of turbulence and resistance. And what I've discovered is, is that when we find these areas, that they relate to very specific memories. So depending on where we find them, I'm able to identify the age that that memory was generated and, you know, some of the circumstances around it. Because different emotions live at different levels in the field. And it's extraordinarily accurate. And this just blows me away over and over and over again. Uh, I teach a lot of classes. That's what really the bulk of my time at the moment is training people how to do this method. And I've trained about 500 people in the last five years. And I actually just started training teachers. I taught a class this past weekend with student teachers for the first time, which was really exciting to see. And so, you know, we just we find these areas and then we just hang out in them. And the body, when you give it a coherent input, it it recognizes its own incoherence. It it perceives its own noise in the signal. And then it finds its factory settings, whether it's in the DNA, you know, I'm not exactly sure where those live in the morphic field of, you know, the human that is you, and it will actually fix itself tonally. And if there is tension in the body around that noise, right, we all have the experience of like, when you're subjected to noise, it puts you in tension. I used to own a really busy restaurant. 
and it had all kinds of compressors and, you know, refrigerators and dishwasher and fluorescent lights. And, you know, every once in a while there'd be a storm and the power would go out. And I would always go, <sighs> right, and just relax because I was holding this subconscious tension around all of that noise. And it's the same inside our bodies. You know, if our adrenals are going off, if we, you know, whatever, if our nervous system's got all this noise in it, when we stop the noise, when we get the noise out of the signal, we open up, we relax, we breathe. And circulation happens of blood, of lymph, of electricity, of information. When that circulation gets enabled, the body just fixes itself. And so what we're really doing is working at the level of the blueprint. And just getting the blueprint plum and square. And once that is ordered, then the body just naturally orders itself. So, you know, in, in plasma physics, there's an understanding that magnetic fields guide electric currents. And so the magnetic field of the body actually really influences the electrical flow within the body. Let's just say your neck goes out all the time, you know, when you're under stress and you've got to go to the chiropractor and he does an adjustment and puts your neck back into place. Well, what I'm going to discover is, oh, you had a sledding accident when you were four. You went underneath a car. You jerked your head back really badly. And so now you have this magnetic freeze, you know, four feet away from from your body on the right side that is related to the, the stressful traumatic input of that accident. And, and your biofield is all in a bunch right here. And I can go in with the sound. Now, just like sound is used to break up kidney stones, it's called lithotripsy, right? They hit, they hit the kidney stone with this pulsed wave frequency that then causes the molecules to separate and the stone will burst into smaller pieces. And then the body can circulate it and pass it out. I'm doing the same thing with a tuning fork in your biomagnetic field. I'm getting, using the sound to break up that restriction, that etheric scar tissue, and bring it back into circulation and to take that knot, that tangle out of your field. So once we get that fixed in your magnetic field, suddenly your neck is not being pulled out towards it anymore when you're under stress. And the electricity will just start to flow beautifully through there and you don't need to go back to the chiropractor. I found it particularly fascinating too that you and several other scientists and practitioners as well, you, you guys posit that, I think you, you touched on this, that memories are stored in this field as like vibratory patterns. And, yeah. and then I think in the book you describe it, you describe something else too, like age rings in the biofield, kind of like a tree would age, you know? Yeah, so that was something that I discovered. You know, it's people, especially at this last class, you know, my student teachers were like, Jesus, Eileen, how did you figure all this out? Like, how did you figure out that that sound means that and that this means this? And, you know, it was just a lot of hours. I, I had a very busy practice. You know, and it's interesting because my work really mostly developed in a small town in the Green Mountains of Vermont, poor, rural, conservative you know, and I didn't have a sign. I was basically like invisible. And the fact that, you know, hundreds of people found me <laughs> and, and created this busy practice, it really is a testament to how effective sound is because it works on the physical, the mental, the emotional, um, what we might call the spiritual, the ancestral. You know, we inherit so much noise and we don't even realize it. So, you know, just many, many hours in clinic just bouncing sound off people and listening and coming to recognize certain patterns. And so what got revealed to me was this timeline aspect wherein information that I found at the, you know, the outer edge of the field, like within that double layer plasma membrane uh, related to gestation, just inside that was birth. And just inside that was like infancy and early childhood. And then information I found close to a person's body was current or recent. And so I discovered this sort of tree ring aspect that as we generate information, it moves away from us and it gets stored in these standing waves in what I have really come to see is like binary coding. It's all just coded in there in these frequency patterns. So, you know, if somebody is uh, 60 and their field extends about five feet away from them, then halfway through, about two and a half feet from their body, we're going to find information from when they were 30. And if they had a big trauma, let's say they went through a big divorce, 
at 30, there's going to be big perturbations in that because they were feeling all of these tumultuous and intense feelings. They were generating big waves. And so just the record of that gets stored. And as we get older, it's like the wave file, you know, compresses and has more and more information. Whereas when we're three or four or five or 10, the field is the same size. It's just that the, there's less information in your hard drive. It's not as compacted. So is that why people have poorer memory as they age then? Yeah, I think there's just more data to sift through. Okay. So they're not necessarily cut off from the energetic field. They just don't know how to sift through it all. Well, that's part of it. But, you know, there's been some interesting research done with microtubules, you know, because they're starting to sniff into the fact that these microtubules in the primary psyllium have something to do with consciousness. I was at a conference a couple of years ago and, you know, somebody was talking about this and I wanted to stand up on my chair and shout, you know, like they're antennas to the information that's in the field. Um, but medical science are not quite ready to make the leap, you know, from the brain to the field. It's a big leap. And, you know, again, uh, from a sexist point of view, I'm a female. I just have a master's in education. I wave tuning forks around people. I mean, there's kind of an image problem there that I've been really confronted with that's forced me to really understand the science as much as I possibly can. Like, you know, I witness this phenomena. I'm encountering these perturbations, these densities, um, these patterns. And as I shift them, profound therapeutic outcomes are happening. So something is going on. There has to be a scientific explanation for this. So microtubules, if they are related to consciousness, which I believe they are, they're antennas to the information in the field. What happens in Alzheimer's is the microtubules start to degrade. They start to actually fall apart. So the apparatus for retrieving the memory is failing. The memories are still there. They're still being stored in the field. It's just the apparatus to retrieve them no longer works. So you have your own cosmology that ties into this too, and it's it's a increasingly popular alternative cosmology, something that you call in the book Electric Universe, Electric You. Some listeners are probably familiar with the EU theory, but for those who aren't, what is it and how does it relate to all this? Well, the Electric Universe cosmology basically says that electricity, not gravity, is the dominant force in space. So Previously, there, it was believed that charge separation couldn't happen in space. Space is a big empty vacuum. It's just cold, hard rocks and thermonuclear furnaces, and there, you know, there's and there's nothing in between. Electric universe theory says that it's all one giant electromagnetic organism. I don't know that they would use that term, but I do. That it's all light and it's all electro, it's all electricity, and that the sun, rather than being this thermonuclear furnace that's burning itself out, is actually like kind of like an electric light bulb. And when you look at these pictures of space, you see all these filaments that connect galaxies, the filamentary structure of the universe. These things are called Birkeland currents. They actually carry electricity across many, many light years in a coherent form, positive and negative charges spiraling. If you look at the way that space behaves, it's, it's exactly the way that electricity behaves here in the lab. Plasma which is basically gas that has its charges separated, right? It's just pure potential electricity. In, a, in EU theory, the sun is an electric dynamo. Uh, the solar wind is a stream of electrically charged particles. It's sort of mind boggling. I think that, you know, people are attracted to EU simply because it does make sense that the story we've been told that our cause, our current cosmological story, again, the standard model you know, in the beginning was nothing, which for no apparent reason exploded. And there was a high degree of order for reasons we can't understand right after that explosion. But ever since then, it's been going into entropy because entropy is all there is. It's all going down. You know, the, the universe is dissipating. It's going to die this thermal heat death. And um, that completely leaves out the syntropic force. You know, if you look up at space, Yes, stars are dying, but new stars are being born. I mean, really, the universe is an electrical perpetual motion machine. And we've been fed this story. Our cosmology, it has black holes and dark energy and dark matter, all these dark things. 
that nobody really completely understands. But what they really are is mathematical constructs because there isn't enough gravity in a galaxy to account for the fact that it hangs together. So they had to create this thing in the middle that (laughs) sucks it in and then this stuff on the outside that pushes it together. It's really all nonsensical. It just... It is not logical. Our our cosmological story, not only is it not logical and doesn't make sense, but it's depressing. You know, the idea that space is an empty vacuum and sound doesn't travel through space. But we have, you know, we've got sound clips. Mickey Hart, who used to be the drummer for The Grateful Dead, he, I was at one of his concerts not that long ago, and he had sound clips of what um, stars sound like and what the sun sounds like. Like, sound travels through space. It travels through plasma. Space is filled with plasma of varying densities. So when I discovered plasma and then I discovered bioplasma, which is basically the idea that, you know, that living things are surrounded with with a magnetic bubble as well. um, It just made sense in the context of the phenomenon that I was encountering. And it made me feel connected. I was like, wow, okay, so if the stars are electricity and my heart is an electrically driven oscillator, then the same power that's powering the stars is powering me. And I really came to see how everything is really connected. You know, in in yogic traditions and spiritual traditions, we say all is one. And yet we have this cosmological story that goes, no, it's a great big vacuum. And there's a whole bunch of nothingness. You know, you can't (laughs) reconcile that with all is one. But when you look at it in the context of it's all electrical plasma everywhere, you can see that you are that and the sun is that and the universe is that, then suddenly you have this sense of connectivity and light. And so we move from this cosmological story of darkness and separation and entropy into this cosmological story of light and connection and syntropy. And it's a completely different feeling in your body when you resonate with that. You mentioned in the book that you came across several studies that claim the magnetic field of Earth has declined by like 80 or 90 percent in the past 4,000 years. And if that's true, and I have no reason to doubt that it is, by the way, but if that's true, what sort of effect would that have on human health and also on planetary health? Yeah, that's a good point. Well, a couple things. So this woman, Valerie Hunt, was a researcher at UCLA uh, in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. She did some really interesting work with the electricity of the human body. One of the experiments they did was they put people into this room called a Mu room, M-U, that was completely electromagnetically shielded. And what they found was that people kind of went to pieces. They sort of fell apart, you know, without that magnetic field around them to contain them and hold them together. They just pretty much went to pieces. And then as soon as they restored the electromagnetic field to the room, then people were fine again. So I think, you know, we're really seeing a tremendous amount of emotionalism, right? (laughs) People are so emotional at the moment. Uh, We're seeing all kinds of health issues. Um, We're we're feeling like this sense that, you know, everything's falling apart, that there's, you know, real chaos, uh, crumbling infrastructure, right? There's definitely a sense of, of that, I think, going on. There are some theories that the magnetic field is decreasing in advance of a pole shift. When I was at the EU conference uh, back this past year in June, I met uh, a fellow who was of the opinion that just like all of our memories as individuals are stored in our own atmosphere, our own little cloud, that all of the memories of Earth are actually stored in the Earth's atmosphere. And that when we undergo a pole shift, that it kind of wipes the hard drive clean and and then kind of resets everything back to, you know, a stronger magnetic field and a clean slate. Yeah, that's an interesting concept. Does that mean that we lose all those memories then for good? You know, that that's a good question. Uh, on, on one hand, yes, and on the other hand, no. And what I mean by that is, is that When I work in people's fields, on a certain level, the memory is always there. Do you know what I mean? Like when I go in, I'm not erasing the memory of your difficult divorce. I'm just smoothing out the vibes and discharging the energy that's trapped there. So on a certain level, what has happened is indelibly imprinted in uh, what we would call the akasha or the ether. You know, everything that ever is, was, or will ever be is present in, in the ether. But I think what happens like in a pole shift is that everything just gets discharged and sort of reshuffled. And, you know, 
in the fossil record, whenever these, there's these catastrophic events that happen in the planet, there's this whole new emergence of new life forms, right? I mean, that's something that, that they've observed. Like, all of a sudden in the fossil record, all these new things appear. And so I think that, you know, the, the morphic field, the sound, whatever part of the universe we're in, you know, the sound current is giving rise to different shapes or forms, uh, and that can't happen until, you know, a certain amount of the old information gets erased. And it's the same thing, you know, in our lives. I mean, when we when we take these stuck places, these places of these stuck stories and fixed vibrations and self-limiting beliefs, when we repattern those and discharge, suddenly in people's lives, new things start to come in, new ways of perceiving, new ways of being, new relationships, new jobs, that sort of thing. You know, the anatomy of the biofield is interesting, too. It, it relates directly to the chakras that I'm sure most people have heard of. And the chakras obviously relate to certain organs in the body and certain emotions and feelings and experiences. I have a, a metaphysical question, though, about this. Is there any connection between the biofield, then, and this idea that we manifest our own reality? So, yes. You know, I see the field... And then beyond that, the brain, it's really more of a filter than than anything else. You know, there's a little soundbite out there that says, in any given moment, we're exposed to something like 40 million bytes of information. And the brain can only really process and filter about 40 bytes of information per second. Now, I don't know if that's true specifically or not. But I think the, the idea is there that our experience gets filtered through our biofield. And if we have beliefs that nobody listens to what I have to say, um, I'm always being rejected and abandoned, you know, I'm, I can't assert myself. What, whatever our stories are, our history, our experience, whatever, those create like lenses that distort our perception of reality. So because of that, Yes, we do create our reality based on our perceptions or our misperceptions. Uh, we, we are what we vibrate. That's just really, really true. And, and the problem is, is that people think that they can change their thinking and change their life. And unfortunately, that's only really part of the equation. Because we have we have our birth trauma, we have all these beliefs we formed under the age of three that are really at the outer edge of our field and are really filtering the information that is coming in. So what makes biofield tuning such a unique and such a powerful modality is that we can actually go into the field and find these structures, find these filters and clean them, you know, make them clear and harmonious. So we start having a much more direct perception of life where we're, we're, we're being present with what is really going on and we're reacting or responding in a way that's appropriate that isn't necessarily triggered because it's passing through all of these filters. So the more clear we become, the more powerful we become at consciously using our vibration to attract things to us. We're yeah. not being, you know, sort of buffeted about by subconscious things we don't see or, or recognize. So you work with tuning forks and crystals, and I'm sure there are many other things that you've dabbled with, but what other sorts of sound healing practices are out there that people should know about? Well, one of the things that's becoming really popular at the moment is uh, crystal bowls, Tibetan bowls, uh, a lot of yoga studios are starting to incorporate sound baths. Uh, people are using gongs, uh, you know, so you can lie down and get a gong bath. You know, that's that's the the acoustic things that people are using. Oh, didgeridoos. I have a, a colleague here in Vermont who does these sound baths with didgeridoos, but he's also teaching people how to play them because when you learn to play the didgeridoo, it strengthens uh, you know, your all the muscles inside your nose and face, and it's helping cure people of sleep apnea, which is really neat to see. So that's kind of sound therapy. There's all kinds of stuff coming out that's digital, binaural beats, the idea that you can play one frequency in one ear and one in the other, and it's going to generate the difference between the two in your brain. So it can manipulate brainwave states, bring you to theta or delta, make you go to sleep, that sort of thing. 
I personally am an acoustic gal and I have no interest in digitally produced files of any kind. That's just me. I'm biased. Like most audiophiles who prefer, you know, vinyl to, to <laughs> right. CD. And it's the same kind of story. So there, you know, there's all different kinds of stuff cropping up right now. And I think, you know, sound is right now kind of how yoga was in the 90s. I was one of the first yoga instructors in eastern Connecticut in 94. You know, now there's yoga instructors everywhere. And I think that that's what we're going to really see with sound is as it dawns on people that, you know, when you lie down and you listen to a sound bath, that you really feel relaxed. It really, sound really changes your state. It really does. It's really powerful. And so many people are already using music anyway. You know, even we could call music as sound therapy, as sound healing. Absolutely. Um, Yeah. You know, it's just not really talked about so much. It's just not really fully grasped or understood. You know, I should have mentioned this to you up front, but I record this podcast at 432 hertz, but... You are my first one that I'm trying at 528 hertz. Ah, interesting. Yeah. I don't know if it makes any difference to the listener. I mean, I know it does, but, you know, with the technology and everything anyways, I'm not really sure if it comes through. And I also am recording an audio blog over binaural beats. I don't know if that's going to work, but it's something I want to try out just to see if I can pull it off. But Why so- not? I, yeah, I'm experimenting with sound in my own podcast, which is interesting. I never thought I would be doing that. But one question that I try to ask everybody that I think is capable of answering it is this. What's love got to do with this? <laughs> I mean, it's all love. You know, that that's to me, it's all light. One light, one love, one mind, one heart. It, it's it's the essence of everything, you know, from a purely geometric standpoint when they've they've done research, the Heart Math Institute has done research on what heart rate variability. And when you are in a state of love or gratitude, your heart actually produces a very coherent sine wave. Okay. So that is how nature forms the Fibonacci sequence, you know, coherence, the very geometry of creation is what we call love. It's groovy. It's being in the sweet spot. And everything else is just noise in the signal. Everything else is just static. And when we get into our own sweet spot and we can use pure tone to bring ourselves into that sweet spot. And what I found is that in every single person I've ever worked on, when we get the noise out of the signal, when we get the static gone and we bring up the underlying harmony, that there is this perfect beauty in everyone. It's there. Now, people have generations of noise in their signal. I mean, you look at what humanity has been through the last hundred years alone, never mind the last few thousand. Underneath the noise, there is a harmonic beauty perfection. There is the ability to be in alignment with creation, with the, the, the nature of creation, which is love. I really believe that with like all my heart and soul that everyone has that capacity because it is what we are. You mentioned yeah. that you had yeah. a, a rough teenage go of it, you know, and I think we all have. It, just one of those times in our lives that really fucks us up, right? Mm-hmm. But what lessons have you learned since then about yourself, you know, since you started this practice with sound therapy that you didn't know back then? Well, you know, I'm very fortunate in that this practice has really healed me of – all of the things that ailed me, you know, all of all of what I went was looking for, I found on, on every level, you know, from the philosophical cosmological level of electric universe theory and that cosmology of light and connection. So, you know, from an existential perspective, that nihilistic angst, that sense of powerlessness, that's all just gone. But from a physical level, I used to suffer from terrible Uh, digestive issues, gas, bloating, indigestion, heartburn, you know, that's a consequence of adrenal fatigue, adrenal, you know, overwhelm. Um, That's a consequence of giving away your power. You know, my, my inner light, my digestive fire was diffuse and, uh, and weak. And that's all been fixed. I mean, I can eat anything, you know, I was just happily eating high gluten bread at my last training and, you know, telling everybody like, you know, gluten, dairy, 
beer, you know, bring it on because I can metabolize that beautifully now. I can eat whatever I want, you know, I never gain weight. Heartburn, all of that's gone. What were some other things? Well, I used to have If that doesn't weight. sell people on sound therapy, I don't know what will. <laughs> I know. That, that's where all my students were like, I want to eat high gluten bread. I'm like, you should. It's <laughs> one of life's great pleasures is bread. You know, how sad that we can't eat it. So, you know, from, from a health perspective, um, from an emotional perspective, you know, I used to, uh, my emotional imbalance was impatience, irritability, frustration. Uh, that's all gone. You know, I still have an occasional moment when I'll get a little fussy, but very, very different than than how it used to be. I've learned how to manage my own energy. And, uh, you know, like I just got back from this two week trip. Uh, I was in Nashville for four days then I was in Denver. Then I was in San Diego. I actually had two all nighters in this last week. I was up all night in the Phoenix airport because we got turned away from San Diego and then I was just did a red eye coming back and I woke up this morning and I feel great. I feel light. I feel clear. I feel coherent. I feel resilient. I feel adaptive. Uh, I feel able to manage stress. And that is what biofield tuning does for you. It, it makes you resilient and able to, you know, adapt to your environment. And, you know, stress is the thing that kills us. And when we learn how to manage stressful inputs, we learn how to dance with them, you know, the body just responds. So I'm so grateful, you know, I'm 48 and I just, I feel better than I ever have. And I feel like I look better than I ever have. And I absolutely attribute it to my work with sound. Absolutely. Uh, Last question for you. Your most recent blog post on your website has a section in it called fuck this and i think the i think the message that you communicate in this section of the blog post is worth sharing here would you mind sharing that well you know one of my friends posted this video on facebook it was swamp thing and and the, the video is on the blog post and and swamp things going through and like fuck this and fuck that and fuck this thing in particular and and I watched it and it was so satisfying to watch it was just like I just watched it over and over again and I, and you know in my classes I swear I definitely you know in per, in real life I swear I I am an enthusiastic belcher I've always loved to burp. You know, my poor mother tried so hard to turn me into a lady, but I was like, it feels really good to let it out. <laughs> and in biofield tuning, we have this this sort of unofficial slogan, which is better out than in. And basically what I find is that it is emotional constipation that really gums people up, that we're so afraid of speaking our truth, of speaking our mind, of expressing our emotions, that we just repress and we repress and we repress. And so, you know, when we learn to to roll with our emotions, you know, I, I mean, I cry almost every day a little bit, whether I'm doing a session on someone that's sad, or I'm seeing something on the news, you know, my emotions just flow right through me, I'm not holding anything back. And so, you know, it feels good to say, fuck this. And so I get these, you know, little old ladies, women in their 70s, who've been all buttoned up and polite their whole life, and I get them swearing. And, you know, we laugh and we giggle and, and we just feel liberated, we get, you know, it's a way to get stuff off your chest. And uh, it's just, it's satisfying. You know, we don't do it in a mean way. It's a playful, playful way. But it just, it's, it's a sound therapy, you know, <laughs> to be able to just be, to just swear without any kind of censoring. Uh, obviously, there's time and a place, you know, where it's appropriate. But yeah, better out than in. And, you know, I think we're seeing this. Just if you look at the climate, I'm saying well, people are so emotional. I think we spent years kind of suppressing and buttoning down and trying to be polite and all that. And now what we're seeing in the culture is people openly expressing, you know, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm blah, blah, blah. Great, let's get it out. Because when we get on the other side of that, it's a place of pure potential. When we get the gunk that's in out, we enter into this spaciousness and that spaciousness holds the potential for creativity, for playfulness, for, for much more fun. So that's that, what that sentiment is all about. Kind of goes against the PC neoliberal safe space (laughs) culture that we're building, but I'm a fan of it. I think it's refreshing (laughs) to, to be vulnerable and let yourself feel everything. You know, it's not bad to feel angry or sad. It's just, you don't, you don't let it control you. Right. 
Right. I mean, what we resist persists and what we repress, we blow. You know what I mean? So when we learn to be with our emotions as they arrive and and manage them uh, in a healthy way, then we're we're not spewing on people. You know, we're we're we get to be more neutral when we actually learn to be with our emotions as they arise. Absolutely. Well, Eileen McCusick, thanks so much for your time. Where can people keep up with you and your work? So I have a website, biofieldtuning.com, and you can subscribe to my newsletter. Um, I do periodical blogs. Um, I teach classes. I do group distance healing sessions because my private practice became so busy I couldn't manage it anymore. And so I decided to do an experiment and see if I could work on groups at a distance. And lo and behold, I can. (laughs) So I have a whole archive of previous sessions and every month I offer new ones and people love them and really claim that uh, they they help them a lot and they're really affordable too so that's an option for people plus I have a find a practitioner page so you know if you want to experience it in person you can look see if there's anybody in your area and uh, and I'm going to be working on a new book so you know stay tuned for information about that coming up Absolutely. I was glad to find I have a practitioner about 90 miles from me, so that's not a bad drive to go get healed. Thanks so much for your time again. I really do appreciate it. I know you're a busy gal, and you're quite a thought-provoking gal as well, so I'm very grateful that you took some time here. Nice. Thanks, Ryan. I'm, I was. This was really fun. All right. My thanks again to Eileen Day McCusick. Check her out online, biofieldtuning.com. That's linked in the show notes. Also linked in the show notes, a link to her book on Amazon if you're interested. I'd personally recommend it. I learned a lot reading it. And if the conversation we just had isn't convincing enough, well, I can't do anything more. I will say that tying all of this up in a cute little ball with the electric universe and electromagnetism and how we're all just kind of operating on the same field here, that's a nice little touch. I can also personally testify to the benefits of sound healing, at least from a digital perspective. I listen to binaural beats. I've been talking about this binaural blog for several weeks now. I'm still working on it, by the way. I also use these CDs called Whole Tones that uh, I'm actually trying to get the creator of on the show here to talk more about those. That's music recorded at different frequencies, uh, 432, 528, which you guys should be familiar with by now just from listening to this show. And beyond my personal experience with sound, I've just read a ton of research by reputable sources that point to this as being a key component to our mental, physical, and spiritual health. And again, I can only testify based on what I've experienced, but, you know, like my episode last week with Satchel McMahon, you know, I've enacted some new health practices that I've seen pay dividends for me personally, and I didn't talk about it with Satchel, but the sound healing is one of those practices, you know? And I also have to say, this episode is a great segue into my next one, and I hope you'll come back for it, because I'll be talking with a writer who just published his first novel, but it's based off his experiences as a government contractor out in New Mexico for Los Alamos National Laboratory, and based on his experiences there, it was important for me to, and it just happened this way coincidentally, but then I scheduled it in the way where it just kind of led into to it, but it was important for me to establish this baseline of sound and frequency because what this guy saw, his name's Craig Smedley, what Craig saw at Los Alamos, gonna blow your fucking mind, guaranteed. What he experienced out there, unreal. And granted, it is a novel, it is fiction, but according to him, rooted in fact. But anyway, that's next week. Thank you for being here this week to hear my chat with Eileen. Hope you come back next week to hang out with Craig and I. Don't forget to subscribe in iTunes, on YouTube, Stitcher, Google Play Music, wherever you're checking this show out, hit that subscribe button. Give us a good rating in the iTunes store. Leave a comment for me wherever you want. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, Pinterest, Snapchat, oculturepodcast.com, oculturepodcast at gmail.com. I'm always looking for feedback. I'm always looking for recommendations, too, for topics or guests. I've already had a couple people reach out to me and connect me with some people, so thankful and grateful for that. Either way, this was a fun one for me. I hope it was a fun one for you, too. You've been listening to O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority.
please rewind this cassette.